Those are all great things that she needs to keep an eye on. Is there anything else that she can do specifically to help uh, reduce her blood pressure, assuming it is a little bit higher than it should be? This is Generation Health. Every week we bring you the latest in cutting edge research, news, and time-tested best practices helping you live a longer, better life. Sitting across from me, Mr. Joey DiMatteo, registered pharmacist, board-certified clinical tr- nutritionist. How are you? Very good, sir. How are you? Tongue-tied. That's how I am. <laughs> <laughs> to my right, All good. Dante DiMatteo, registered pharmacist, certified strength and conditioning specialist, and top, si- top 5%? of uh <laughs> all crossfit athletes worldwide uh is that five four percent what was it like, something like that the, wow. the results are at this point still unofficial so I, fourth I, fifth yeah fourth fifth percentile maybe i don't know yes you do but you're being modest but this you know the stairs could be cheating and people not submitting scores that are getting factored into that percentile but towards the towards the top it could, go either, it could go either way then yeah <laughs> Somebody worth having on your team. That's, uh, that's, that's, what that's he pretty is. incredible. My name is Thanks, Tyler guys. Andrews. I'm the host. Uh, and on today's show, we are going to talk about questions from you guys, listener questions. Um, something uh, we got something about high blood pressure, supplements, and interactions with pharmaceuticals uh, and prescriptions. And we've also got the big topic of supplementing on a budget because as things change economically, that becomes a bigger challenge. But first, what we all need to know. What have you been meaning to do for years, but still haven't uh, gotten around to doing? Oh, <laughs> it's very quiet. For years. Uh-oh. Wait, I don't have any like real fancy answer or anything. I, and it's something I've alluded to before, but I just want to start, I need to start reading more consistently. Setting aside time, either at night or in the morning to read consistently. I read kind of in waves. Good for a few weeks, off for maybe a few months, and then back on for a few weeks. So not the fanciest answer, but that's what comes to mind at a first first blush. So. Fair enough. Also, maybe learning a language, too. I have wanted to learn another language, but that's that's a whole... Which one? Um, Italian is what I'd like to learn the most. Really? Yeah. Just because just roots? My, yeah. I'm 100%, 100% Italian, so something I would love to do. But And I got the Rosetta Stone. I did like the beginning of it, but it's just... <laughs> It's like, oh man, this is gonna take forever. I don't have time to stick with this. So that would probably be one B. Would be would be that. Buongiorno. If I could do that for a little period of time. Fettuccine. <laughs> That's about the extent of my knowledge of Italian. Yeah, yeah. it's a beautiful <laughs> language, though. It really is. That's it's awesome. Really beautiful, Dante. I would say um, probably just just getting this local gym opened yeah. up. Yeah, and doing more doing more coaching. Yep. You know, it's it's one thing to continue to try and learn about coaching and stay current with coaching practices and exercise stuff, but actually coaching more people and trying to get a local spot opened up is something that just I've been meaning to do for a long time. I just gotta we just gotta do it. Understood. So. Understood. Um see, see this shows you where my brain was when I picked this question. I was thinking like um uh, repainting the house uh or buying a new t- kitchen table cuz the old one is awful but it also has got all the child damage and the children aren't quite old enough to never damage the table again so it sticks around just a little bit longer and that's I like, hate it's it it's always my couch time. issues i can't get a new couch when the kids just yeah. terrorize it you know yeah that's the you don't want to you don't want to buy it when you know they're going to destroy yes. it yes our carpet we need to replace our carpet it's so gross it needed to be replaced when we moved in and that was Almost ten years ago, <laughs> it's awful now. But every Your time I'm getting like, old enough, though, every time I'm about to do something with that, a kid spills, you know, grape juice on the carpet, and I'm like, I'm glad that's not brand new. Sets you mm. back. I don't even months. care. It's fine. It's just stained. It's fine. <laughs> oh man, no, that was. That's. Uh, I hear. You. I hear you on that one. Yeah. Though. I like that. Your answers are much better, though. I feel like I should start a gym and read more. <laughs> well, just cause, because you read enough already, Tyler. No, 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 no. <laughs> Never enough. We've got a question in uh, from Deborah. This was emailed to us at questions at askjoedematteo.com. That is where you can get your questions answered if you would like to. She wanted to know, high blood pressure has always been an issue with me. I take medication, which helps sometimes. However, it still seems high on occasions. Is there anything I should do or take 
There's there's definitely a lot to unpack with the yeah. with the question. Sure. For, for a very straightforward question, there's a lot of angles. For yeah, sure. yeah. I think I re- reread it a hundred times <laughs> just to <laughs> really. Yeah, just I don't know. Not not that you're trying to scrutinize it too in depth because I you know we see the spirit of what she's asking. You know, she just wants to wants to know if there's anything else out there to manage hypertension and and all that sort of thing. But as always, I think it's there's always questions that pop up. When sure. after reading a question like that, um, so specifically would be, you know, which blood pressure medications are you actually taking at this point? Um, what does seems high yeah. actually mean? Is she routinely checking this on her own? Is she checking it from home? Is she going to a pharmacy and getting it checked? Has she had a hundred doctor appointments? You know, are these like regular in office readings? Is this something that you just feel? Is it know? an election year? Is it <laughs> <laughs> exactly? So it just I think. Again, just trying to trying to understand maybe more, you know, more of the context on her end. I don't know if you have anything to add. Just, yeah, just from that standpoint. same same kind of thing that I hung on to is the high on occasions. Um, so I think again, there's different ways to go. The way I ended up taking it yeah. is that the high on occasions means that she's checking it, and I'm reading a lot into this, but this right, is just, this right, is just right, what right. I rolled with. She's checking it on her own. Because if it was high at every doctor visit or every other doctor visit, her meds would probably be adjusted. So I'm assuming that she's she's okay at the doctor's office. She's okay a lot of time. Occasionally, though, she's she's throwing on that cuff or stopping at a pharmacy and putting on the cuff and running high. That's for, I guess, for the purposes. And there's other, yeah. again, we can make it more broad, but that's the way I took it. But I had the same question. What does high on occasions mean? Yeah. And then that, I'm, I'm glad that you went there with it because- um, you know, when looking, when looking at just like the, the various hypertension guidelines, let's say, and in, in terms of how it's treated and how it's assessed, something so simple as just getting a, just getting a blood pressure reading, you know, at this point it's like, you know, blood work, blood pressure, you know, you just, yeah. it's so easy. It's done right all the time. There's no issues. Well, in fact, blood pressure, you know, the, the machine that's testing it, the individual that's testing it where you're testing it, the, you know, the setting in which the, the blood pressure reading is, is being taken is all important. You know, I think those are all things we can kind of get into here because yeah. beyond making a, you know, a supplement recommendation or a medication recommendation or change, you know, I think again, just understanding how important proper readings or the proper settings for readings is, you know, is something that we want to, you know, Definitely. kind of, kind of want to get to. And then even what, what Joey was alluding to is something called masked hypertension. Oh, so okay. You go to the doctor's office, you're w- within a normal range or within the range that they're, you know, the goal that they're looking for. But then when you go home or just in daily living, you're running this higher, you know, you're running higher blood pressure. Interesting. So, That's opposite of what I would expect. I would yeah. think that the white coats come in and your blood pressure spikes. Yeah. That's so a the, very specific thing though. Yeah. You know the, what I mean? Yeah. The yeah. guidelines, they, they sort of split it up into those two categories of, um, you know, sort of like ancillary issues. Yeah. You have you have the hypertension that that isn't overt where you go to, you know, you go to the office, the readings are within a normal range, and then you, you know, throughout daily daily living it's it's elevated and then masked, or excuse me, then um white coat uh okay, so hypertension that is, a thing. is okay is the opposite. And yeah. so and I I'm so white white coat hypertension isn't the big isn't a big deal because it's a very specific it's a very, stimulus. It response. is a big deal, but it's it's a very individualized um, psychological issue, okay. you know, essentially, which becomes a physiological or physical issue. But if, if it, if it, if you feel like you're being tested, you're under pressure, this blood pressure reading, Oh my God, what's going to happen. And you start to get elevated in that way, then you get the white code syndrome. But some people, you know, um, they've been sitting down for 10 minutes, 15 minutes of their appointment. They're relaxed. It's routine yeah. versus, you know, you may say you stop at, you know, the local pharmacy and get your blood pressure checked. You may have just been, especially yeah. if you're elderly, not real active, you may have just been pushing your shopping cart around for 10 minutes and then you sit there and test your, test your blood pressure. Right. It's going to be elevated. You recommend five minutes, ideally of being stationary and a minimum of three minutes. So okay. that's a key thing too. And then to what Dante was saying, um, I would, I would try not to get tested. Well, you know, I, whatever you test it once or twice a week, one time it's at the pharmacy, one time it's this person, one time it's at home. Try mm-hmm. to stay consistent. Yeah. Cause even if that machine has some flaws, at least they become, Everyone has a flaw right. versus the different flaws you're trying to put. You can see together. a trend. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And the other, the other thing I wanted to add with, um, white coat hypertension, yeah. you know, Joey said it, you know, it, it is a big deal, 
Because again, even if, even if it's, even if they confirm that, yes, your blood pressure only becomes elevated at these appointments, regardless, your, your doctor's going to want to try to do additional investigation or testing. So there's ambulatory blood pressure monitoring tests that are often, you know, patients are sent home with. Huh. And so you get 24 hour readings of, of your blood pressure. So you can actually watch it in real yeah. time, more or less. And, and granted, you know, you, you are going to have fluctuations, you know, when right. you exercise or right. when you're, you know, doing more, when there's more physical exertion and such, but they have ways of quantifying resting. Cause really what we're looking at here is resting blood pressure. That's right. the key. You know, those, those transient elevations and blood pressure when you're exercising, those, those are, per, are the one, the instances where there's benefit. That's mm-hmm. acting as it should. Right, we want right. to have more blood pressure when we need that that infusion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense, and it's a huge issue then when somebody has normal blood pressure at the op, you know, at the office, and then they come home, right? And they their ele- you know their elevations are more notable, and so mm-hmm. then her masked hypertension. Yes, and okay. So maybe so in essence, I mean, looking at Deborah's question, that's that's kind the- of what we can you know, imply here. And just in the most basic uh, form of things we deal with every day, um, when you're under stress, we think, well, stress leads to high blood pressure. But just in a quick nutshell of how that happens, basically that's fight or flight. Your body releases catecholamines, releases adrenaline. That's your body essentially entering a ready state. It releases glucose. It's basically getting your body ready to fight. So when you're under stress, um, and even if it's just that chronic daily stress, that can raise your blood pressure. Also, um, when your blood sugar is low, um, catecholamines, that same adrenaline gets released by the body to help again, release glucose because your blood sugar is low. Huh. So you may, you may be running high blood pressure at a given time because you haven't eaten all day. Wow. Um, so just to watch out for some symptoms of low blood pressure, fast heartbeat, shaking, sweating, not, um, nervousness, anxiety, all those things kind of go in with that fight or flight or stress. If you could tell there's a lot of overlap there, yeah. irritability, dizziness, hunger, so just everyday things that can be occurring that may affect that number that, that, that you get on a Thursday versus the next, next Thursday. Also dehydration. Um, yeah. When you're dehydrated, your body releases vasopressin. So what's that trying to do? What's that's trying to do that hormone um, via the kidneys, it helps you to retain water because you're dehydrated. But what that's also doing constricts blood vessels. This, that's a byproduct. Your blood pressure goes up. So just even just understanding the basic mechanism of how everyday things we all deal with, a little bit of low blood sugar, a little bit of stress, a little bit of you know dehydration can affect your blood, sh- your blood pressure reading pretty significantly. Okay. So Deborah needs to make sure that she's hydrated. She needs to make sure that she's eating appropriately and keeping her blood sugar stable, which is just a good idea in general. That's You exactly. don't want that spiking all over the place. Um, because when you look at it broadly, these are things that we should be looking out for our health throughout the day, right? Because if they're causing spikes in blood and, and blood pressure, they're doing other things to your body. And if you're in this state chronically, it's more than just about that test or that reading that day, right? You know, um, and caffeine to watch too, I, I, that is kind of more <laughs> of a, I don't want to call it an artificial reading, but it is something to be aware of. You know, the, um, you begin to see the effects of caffeine on blood pressure 30 minutes after ingestion. It can be up to four hours. Wow. So depending on what your body's used to, um, if you have an ab- abnormal amount that day, et cetera, n- no um, enemy of caffeine in modern amounts by any means, but it's just something to be aware of. Sure. Okay. All right. So those are all great things that she needs to keep an eye on. Is there anything else that she can do specifically to help uh, reduce her blood pressure, assuming it is a little bit higher than it should be. She's already taking medication. Is there anything else she should be doing? I mean, realistically, I mean, just when we talked about um, high cholesterol or stroke or whatever the case, there's non-pharmacological uh, interventions that can be made. There's pharmacological interve- interventions that can additionally be made in her case. Sure. So if we just start broadly looking at the non-pharmacological, um, we can first kind of start with the big one. You know, you look at somebody's uh, dietary patterns. And so why would we do that? Um, weight loss, you know, if, if somebody if somebody is, you know, qualifies for the need to to lose weight, let's just say, they you can potentially see upwards of a one point of blood pressure lowering per one kilogram of body weight loss. Hmm. So that's 2.2 pounds. Wow. For each 2.2 pounds that you lose, theoretically there there is a there's a marked blood pressure lowering effect there. So, so if, you, if you lose 22 pounds, roughly speaking, 10 points of blood pressure reduction. Right. Again, that's, um, 
you know, that's looking at a large group average. Sure. But at the same time, that's, you know, just because it's an, you know, a, uh, lifestyle intervention, that's, that's a, that's a pretty big one. That is. Yeah. So, um, and then dietary breaks down into, you know, a whole host of other recommendations, trying to reduce dietary sodium and increase dietary potassium. Okay. Now the big thing there, um, we could tell Deborah, you know, try to eat less than, you know, four grams of sodium per day and try to eat X grams of potassium a day. Sure. You know, I think those are the, those are the type of recommendations that it, you're hard pressed to see anybody make, go home and make a real change with that. So kind of just comes back to the old, um, less processed foods, more, you know, more minimally processed foods, more whole foods and, you know, ensuring that you're, you're building a well-balanced plate with those food items. You are generally going to see less dietary sodium makes you know, sense less you know or excuse me more potassium with greens and vegetable different vegetables fruits and such nuts legumes you know the old the old recommendations yep. that we come back to time to time and more you know if if she wanted a more specific dietary recommendation or she she wanted to look at you know maybe a um a plate that that's sort of pre-built for her and mm-hmm. you know, she could look at the dash diet and so that's the the diet that we all learn about in you know pharmacy school and and is often recommended in um you know reducing hypertension preventing hypertension so sure I don't that know makes if you sense. Any, any more dietary stuff I mean that's a pretty yeah that's I think you nailed it I think from a supplement standpoint it's kind of to change gears a little bit yeah um magnesium yep. magnesium is going to be a, a key key thing and I think too you want to make sure that. Um, if you are taking magnesium, that it's an absorbable, bioavailable, active form of magnesium. Usually, those are forms that are attached to chelates, amino acid chelates, like glycinate, lysinate, malate. A little bit of oxide and citrate are fine, but you don't want it to be all of that. Okay. Um, those can have a laxative effect, not real systemically um, well absorbed. So the other thing that's key is, you know, we'll have people say, "Well, I heard glycinate's the best. I just want glycinate. Why does yours have all four of these?" Because essentially, what happens is, you're even if it's a good form and it's an active form and it's it's absorbing into your into your body, you still you kind of maximize pathways if you take oh. all glycinate. When you take these different forms, your body is absorbing them like an amino acid. There's there's different avenues, different path, pathways for it to be absorbed. The magnesium when it's bound to these different um, you know salts and chelates. So that's a key thing, and that's why we recommend a broad one. Um, you know, it's essentially what happens is what you're relying for, for a mag oxide or calcium carbonate, those, those types of salts, Sure, you're relying on passive absorption, um, via essentially just, it dissolves in the stomach and it ionically it absorbs versus an active absorption, which is those uptakes via the amino acid pathways that I was talking about. Okay. So that's the more scientific way of why is glycinate better than carbonate? Those kind of things. Whenever people say that whatever the supplement's more expensive or it's different than this one, that's really in a nutshell what it is. Um, but back to magnesium itself, um, it's a natural uh, calcium channel blocker. So essentially that's some meds work that way in a much stronger way, sure, but it helps yeah. to relax blood vessels. So you're not going to add this to your med and, you know, crash when your blood pressure is going to dip so low, but in a mild way, it does relax those blood vessels via that act, via that mechanism. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is uh, magnesium deficiency is so common. Um, some studies estimate, uh, estimate up to 57% um, of people are deficient. It has to do with our soil and eating yeah. processed food and high sodium. Those are all kind of replacing, um, you know, sodium in the diet. So um, the thing you want to watch out for whenever you have a very high calcium diet, say you are elderly, maybe, you know, Deborah's taking a lot of calcium because she's 75 and her doctor told her to, et cetera, right. for bone right. health. Um, you're going to decrease intracellular magnesium levels as well as whenever you too much coffee, too much acid Mm -hmm. just has to do with the ionic, um, you know, cellular status. So just watch out for that as well, that you, you almost kind of end up, um, kicking out some of the magnesium for lack of a better word. When you have these acidic foods, like in sodas, when you have too much calcium, um, that's, that's, you know, could be one ramification of it. So the other thing is magnesium is good for a lot of other things. Bone health, mood, muscle relaxation, hydration, yeah. obviously blood pressure regulation, and, and stress response, response in general. So those are, you know, magnesium is first and foremost. It's going to have other benefits. More specific, hawthorn, taurine, hops, all those are different vasodilators that can, again, in a mild way, um, help your body to, you know, to get that blood pressure down and really buy, you know, relax the blood vessels. That's the mechanism it would work by. Um, also, you can look out for L-theanine. Okay. Um, that's going to help on the stress anxiety end. So kind of a backdoor way to help high blood pressure. 
is again, managing stress, managing some of that anxiety and those, it kind of blocks some of the glutamate um, or the excitatory chemicals in the brain. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Hopefully that helps Deborah. Anything else before we move on? Um, the biggest thing here, um, she needs to know exactly what the num what her numbers are. I mean, this is not something that we, I would say we play around with at all. Right. Because like cholesterol, you, you know, you live a lifetime of this subtly persistent, this subtly elevated blood, blood glucose, um, blood cholesterol, hypertension, yep. you know, Oh, it's only 132 over 81. That right. It's, it's not, you know, you're not in stage two hypertension per se, but again, it's, it needs to be stressed that, you know, you got to go talk to your doctor about this because maybe you haven't had the ambulatory reading done. Maybe they, maybe it would be beneficial to be sent home with the 24 hour monitoring just to yeah. see, just to kind of paint a bigger picture here. Um, again, we don't, we don't have all of her medical history, of course. Sure. So there's, yeah. there's a limitation and just in answering this question as, as thorough as we possibly could, but depending on her age and depending on all these sorts of things, the hypertension could be secondary to another condition. There's a little less likelihood to that potentially, but things that are wor at least worth noting that any sort of conditions that involve um, pathology of the kidneys, because your your kidneys are arguably you know the most one of the most important organs as as far as regulating blood pressure. There could be underlying issues there, depending on age and other factors. Um, the old obstructive sleep apnea could yep. be untreated. Yep. And that's, you know, the, the hypertension is potentially secondary to something like that. And then additional, additionally, you know, more uncommon causes, things that have, that we have discussed as well. You know, we're looking at hypo or hyperthyroidism, Cushing's, you know, Cushing's disease, these, um, you know, endocrine conditions that, yeah. that, you know, it's, it's, you're hard pressed to ever look at this stuff in a vacuum and, you know, throw one or two things at it and see a, a change. And then, also, just so she knows at, at kind of maybe how this, this will look, she might, she might go to her doctor's office and, you know, she's taking low sartan, let's say she's on 25 milligrams a day, lower dose of low sartan. They, they determine that her blood pressure, given that medication is not super well controlled and they want to do something else there, they might increase the dose a little bit, but they're more likely, at least from my understanding that they're probably going to add another medication really? versus maximally titrating the given dose. And so the, is that because they work in a different way? Yes. They're going to, they're going to hit this with a, yes, with a different mechanism. So okay. there's, there's, you know, four or five classes or whatever of blood pressure medications that could be used. They're going to try and, you know, just try to cover all bases before maximally titrating the dose. Because as you increase the dose, you're, you're at a higher risk of, you know, the adverse effects yep. of the given Absolutely. mechanism. So yeah. That's, you know, that's often how that plays out. I would say that's, that's kind of really all I would have to add as far as maybe some of her expectations. Um, exercise is another massive, you know, massive factor here. I would wager to say that maybe she's not exercising quite enough yeah. and that she can begin to push that. Um, and it's not just aerobic exercise. It's both the aerobic exercise and the muscle strengthening exercise that have a marked benefit on blood pressure. Um, and as far as aerobic exercise goes, I know, I know we always talk about the, um, like the amount that's required. So shooting for 150 to 300 minutes per week is the, you know, it's like maybe in the back of your mind, the number that you want to think of. Right. But as far as level of effort, um, and there, are, there's a multitude of people who, who talk about the talk test. And so you're like, how do I know that the aerobic exercise that I'm doing is enough? Well, give your, you know, take the talk test. Are you having trouble, you know, holding a conversation or you're not straining to speak, but it at least, you know, it's at least a barometer to say, okay, somebody can tell that I'm exercising and I'm, you know, I'm having trouble carrying, you know, sort of a normal conversation. That makes sense. But, um, lifestyle wise, I would say dietary, um, exercise, two of the biggest ones for sure. Very cool. Very cool. Stuff. That's a very <clears throat> comprehensive answer for Deborah's relatively straightforward question that apparently <laughs> never, wasn't never, never straightforward. straightforward. And we still have way more we could have gone into and eventually maybe will, but yeah, yeah. It's man. Well, okay. So, um, <clears throat> every time I look at the stock market, my blood pressure goes up. Uh, things have been getting a little sketchy out there. I've wanted to talk about this for ages. Um, there was a very long time when I couldn't afford any sort of supplementation what is someone supposed to do when they're 
on a limited budget, but want to take steps to be healthier. Or income goes down, or prices of everything goes up, or, or what have you, when the external factors are constricting what you can actively do in that world. So, yeah, I mean, big question. Yeah, lifestyle changes. And Dante obviously speaks to those very well. Um, or number one, you know, if you start just piling a bunch of supplements, but you're eating, you know, very Makes poor sense. diet, overweight, all, all that. I think we kind of kind of know all that. That you know, besides details, I think in general we know the lifestyle is going to be critical. And we do have a lot of people that kind of try to cover up some of those things by taking supplements. We we see it a lot, and it's it's yeah, it's a natural urge. Um, but in terms of supplements themselves, I guess is kind of the way I took it is, um, you know, there's, uh, there's always this hot new supplement, this hot new fad and people want to be healthy and they want in a lot of ways, um, I don't want to say this the right way, but to kind of take an easier, easy way out via a pill or a supplement versus some of those lifestyle changes. So it's, it's always one thing after another. And these are good supplements, but it's collagen and it's krill oil. And it's, it's these different, like what about type three collagen? And you end up getting all these questions about things that really I still think the basics are where to begin. And I think most importantly, individualized. So yes, you can read X article about, about this certain issue. Um, but you know, the, it's, it's going to come down to what do you need? If you're getting, if you're getting more elderly and you, you have, you know, a history of, bone fractures in your family and, and maybe, maybe you're osteopenic, you, you, you've got to hit number first and foremost, therapeutic to you, the multi, the multi, you know, mineral vitamin D products. Okay. Whereas somebody in their thirties maybe eats a poor diet, a lot of, a lot of processed food. They maybe are missing a lot of m micronutrients and a multivitamin is really good for them. So it really just depends individually where you are, what your health concerns are um, and what's needed, you know? So I think in a broad sense, it's hard to answer because it would be like a presentation style, Sure, but it would come down to, you know, individual concerns to me about what you need. If you, if you, if you eat a great diet, your need for a multivitamin goes down. It doesn't mean you're getting all those things, but it goes down versus somebody who eats a poor diet. It just does. Um, if you're outside a lot, your vitamin D is probably okay. If you're inside all the time, you need to look at vitamin D. So again, it just really depends. I don't think it's one size fits all. There are some basic supplements that can be of benefit to anybody, but it's really, to me, starts to stratify on an individual basis. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so <clears throat> you said lifestyle first. Mm -hmm. Stop doing the things you know you shouldn't be doing. Start doing the things you know you should do at some level, you can't supplement your way out of really bad you habits. cannot, no. Right, okay. And then beyond that, when you do get into supplementation, that one of the keys is um, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Yes. That, that just because, you know, you heard magnesium or uh, calcium or whatever is a really great supplement doesn't mean you specifically need it. Uh, that that isn't necessarily the top of the list. If you can only afford to buy one supplement, yes. then don't just go with the and, one you've heard the think, most about. Yes, and in particular, if you start getting more and more into herbal products, say you're on some meds, say again, you're, you, you're really kind of deep into it and you're looking at a whole lot of herbs, yeah. those I think you want to be a little more careful with because you don't know exactly where they're coming from. Are they standardized? Are they, are they interacting with your meds? And they may be causing some things we don't know about. Okay. So I think you'd be a little more careful with those. If you're talking vitamin D and you can get your level checked, you're talking vitamin C, um, you're talking you know, a good multivitamin, you know, a basic dose of fish oil. In my opinion, um, there are exceptions to everything, but sure. um, in general, those things, you're going to be fine with those. You, you, besides money, right. essentially, right. there's not, there's a very limited ability to have a downside there versus if you're, you're really hitting some more, I don't want to say out there, but just, you know, right. more of an herbal, um, or if you're dealing with really, really mega doses, when you start getting into those things, you want to be careful, but it, you know, again, you're talking normal serving size of multivitamin, maybe with the omegas, watch if you're on some blood thinning things. Like I said, there are always some concerns right. potentially, but in general, you're doing those things. You're doing D you're doing mag. You're going to be fine. Okay. Um, there's certain, yeah, there's certainly worse things, you know, people could be adding to their, to their daily routine. Exactly. You know what I yeah, mean? There's, sure. there's, the, those specifically do just come with a generally low side effect risk profile. And so, yeah, you're looking at quality. So what I hear is sort of quality, and well, at least what we've covered so far, quality and safety yeah. are the, are the biggest things. And then also, you know, and under those umbrellas, obviously there's a whole host of different things, you know, depending on what medications you're on, all that kind of stuff. I don't need to repeat everything Joe said, but those are, those are, um, those are massive points 
further expanding upon the uh, individualization of the, you know, of this process. I think that everybody, depending on, you know, where they're, where they're at in their life, you know, they're, they're going to have a different maybe list of non-negotiables. Okay. Uh, you know, of certain products. So I don't How know do you if, mean? <laughs> actually, let me just add this. This was funny. As I was preparing for this, there was a, um, <laughs> there was something that Dr. Peter Atia said. Yeah. He was talking to Huberman. Yes. <laughs> And actually, I wasn't even preparing. I was just just listening. To <laughs> you were it, just, it just enjoying, came, just enjoying. <laughs> and it came up, and he said, and, and Atia is not very. He doesn't have a real like arrogant undertone. So it was actually a bit surprising when he said this. Um, and I don't think he was meaning it in any sort of you know derogatory manner. But um, Huberman jokingly called this Atia's role, and he said, "Don't quibble about nutrition or supplementation until you dial in your exercise or strength." And so mm. that's kind of what we said with the lifestyle stuff. But, you know, Atia, he went even further and said, you know, can you, can you dead hang like your body weight? Can you hang from a pull-up bar for a minute without a, without a break? Can you wall sit for two minutes? Can you deadlift your body weight 10 times? Like, could, do you have, do you have these higher standards? Like, do you have these standards set for yourself to, you know, to sort of address first before you even start asking some of these you right. know, more in-depth questions. So it's just, again, I'm just more or less echoing that that, that sentiment is out there. Yeah, no, that's, you know, and that it's, is, it's coming from experts and it's not to be, it's not to tell people that some of these changes that they're making by adding supplements, they, you know, they just, they fall void of benefit. Right. Um, but man, there, <laughs> there is a world of unrealized benefit. Yes. When you can tap into the things that I mentioned. Right, right. We want people to buy supplements because it, keeps us paid. But mm -hmm. um, when it comes to helping people, and especially on a budget, mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of playing around the edges if you're not addressing the core issues Definitely. and, and diet and exercise well lifestyle. Those are all huge. So start there. If you don't have the funds, go exercise. Mm -hmm. Makes yeah. sense. Makes Absolutely. sense. And there, there's no, there's really no, as far as like all cause mortality, um, there's, you're hard pressed to see a more Marked difference made, um, you know, in terms of longevity for individuals that have higher amounts of muscle mass and higher amounts of strength, specifically, all cause mortality is drastically reduced wow. when when you maintain both of those things for longer. So there's no amount of vitamin D, there's no amount of magnesium, you know, on somebody who's who's generally right. healthy in that right. respect. No, there's no amount of any of those things that can that can make up for that. You can't supplement your way out of a bad lifestyle. Makes I would sense. say, I would, I would say as specifically as just start lifting weights. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate that it is that simple. I want it to be more complex than that, not, but not simple as far as making the change, but just as far as like, what, what did I take from that? It yeah. was just very, it was just a very, you know, um, just a simple point. That's all, but not if, of course, not easy for everybody to just for a multitude of reasons, to right. just Make it happen. Like, so I that's where that. the focus should be. That's, so let's yeah, assume absolutely. that let's assume that my lifestyle is under control, that I am exercising, I'm eating a reasonable diet, um, and I have a little bit of money and I want to try and supplement. Are there certain things I should probably start, start with? Obviously it's, it's individualized, but yeah. top two or three that everybody I, could consider. Yeah. I guess to, to directly answer your question, um, couldn't go wrong with, omegas and multivitamin, you okay. know, start there. Um, but again, what, are you outside a lot? Vitamin D can creep in there very quickly. Right. Um, if you have some bone issues, et cetera, you're taking a lot of calcium, magnesium yeah. can creep in there very quickly as well. Yeah. So, um, I guess I kind of want to, and we can definitely go over that, but I just kind of want to touch on a couple things to be a little more specific in terms of maybe where the supplements, um, real value comes in. Yeah. Um, so for just, I'm just going to take a few examples. We've talked about vitamin D, how critical it is in terms of the supplement itself. It's a pretty simple supplement. Yeah. It's vitamin D three. It's put in an oil. It can, it can be very cheaply made that one in our brand, just being quite honest versus versus a shelf brand. Yeah. Ours is guaranteed quality. And maybe some of the other ones are a little iffy, but in general, you can get away with that. It, it's vitamin D is very simple. When you start talking about a fish oil, something mm -hmm. that is extracted from a fish, right. essentially, um, you, you, now the quality becomes a major issue. Not just is the, you know everything from the amount of EPA and DHA, DHA in there um, is is important, but still, what's on the label 
These are not regulated like drugs. Doesn't necessarily match what's on the bottle. So, so for something like a fish oil, you've got to look at you know where the fish come from. You know, ours are from Nordic waters. You've got to look at the extraction method, mm -hmm. molecular distillation. Um, you've got to look at then after is, are there are you, the positives in there, which is the correct amount of EPA and DHA, and are we free of the negatives, mercury impurities, etc. Right, right. Then you've got to look at the time. So even if the product is made properly, it's got a three-year shelf life. Where is it in two and a half years? Our products yeah. eventually get tested years out close to the expiration date. So I just put up one study from The Guardian, not a supplement website. So they, they don't yeah, have yeah. any skin in the game. Um, one in 10 fish oil supplements. So that's where, again, mm -hmm. I, people say, well, they'll name me a random brand. Is this good? I'm like, I don't know. It could be. It could be our quality, it, but it may not be. I can't right. tell you. All I can tell you is ours are good. I can't tell you a given right. one is bad per se. Right. Especially We're if, not paying to test every other brand. Exactly. <laughs> there's, there's a lot out there. So one in 10. Um, tested from 60 large retailers. So any 10, any 10 um, companies that could be found in 60 large retailers um, were rancid. Essentially wow. means they go bad. Smell, um, fishy taste, and, the, and the, basically the breakdown of the EPA and DHA. It's one out of 10. Um, so then they also found basically 11 times higher than the recommended level, uh, levels of what they're calling rancidity. Ugh. So, I mean, that's extremely common. These are just pulled off the shelf. These are not expired. So... If you're talking about a fish oil and it's something you're going to take, um, it that is one where the money's probably better spent than a vitamin D. Something like a probiotic as well. Um, ours are tested. Essentially, um, the way that it's manufactured is the, the label says 12 billion. It's got more like 15 or 16 because okay. there is going to be some breakdown. So the 12 billion on the bottle is really where we can guarantee it is at the expiration date, for example. So that's one thing as well. If you, it may start at 12, if the product says 12, but then if you take it two years later, it's at eight or nine. Yeah. Not the end of the world, but again, those are things that, and, and also just the testing of them. It could say whatever it wants on the bottle, what's actually in there. Ours get tested that each of those live organisms is, is in there. So again, the labels can say anything they want in this industry. Yeah. And that's where we kind of make our hay, so to say, because we do test them because we do work with particular companies and then the multivitamin. It's not so much maybe about the quality of the product in terms of its testing, but it's about the, the forms that are in there. You've got the activated folate forms. Your body may not methylate real well and convert folic acid. It's got the active folic acid. It's got methyl B12. Um, it's got better forms of magnesium. So that is, is more of a, literally the label is telling you the, the, what the difference is there versus maybe like our omegas. It's the behind the scenes stuff. Sure. It's not a mega dose or anything like that. It's the quality of how it's extracted. So those are a few specific examples. You know, there are certainly more, um, but in, in a broad sense, um, you know, quality comes, starts to really break down to which is it tested and which comp, which product are you dealing with? Okay. So let me see if I can translate this. So you yeah. said when it comes to supplementing on a budget, there are certain things you can cheap out on. You can, you can go with the general brand and it's probably going to be fine. But for m most of the heavy hitter products like a, uh, an Omega or, uh, um, uh, Probiotic. probiotic that going with a cheaper brand, not only is it not going to have the effect, but it may, in the case of a rancid fish oil, might actually be detrimental to you in buying that cheap product. And so you're fully officially wasting all of your money. Correct. Doing that. Yeah. Not to mention then there's, there's a lot of you know smaller scale issues, you know, supplement companies kind of pop up and yeah, they yeah, make yeah. this really hot, item but it's because it's got a drug in there and they, oh, they wow. sell it like crazy for two years and then they they show it they get shut down things like that those those things out there occur um i don't think that's that's the average thing you're gonna grab at a pharmacy shelf but right. it is out there yeah. and it mm -hmm. is especially if you're getting more specialty things um you know dante has more to add to that but that's that's certainly out there as well so there are you know concerns at different levels but i certainly would be respectful of the budgetary concerns and again that's why i would you know really help to, you know, even like vitamin C, if you, you know, if you're going for the absolute best vitamin C, yes, ours is worth spending the money on. Um, and especially the powder form, it is ex expensive to make, to make it palatable, to make it dissolvable with the, the minerals. But you know, if you're just looking for some basic, you know, if you just a low dose vitamin C, if you're, if you're looking to parse out, you know, the, um, 
you know, the budget and yeah. where to spend, where not. Maybe you could do vitamin C, vitamin D. Those can be some basic things. Maybe you do, you do kind of cut out just being honest, you know, yeah. Yeah. um, vitamin C is, again, is, is far superior ours, buffered, et cetera. But again, I'm just trying to stratify them as all. Sure. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Makes sense. Are there, are there any situations where, um, especially with budget in mind, we just skip the supplementation altogether and just stick with the pharmaceuticals and let it do its job? Um, I would, that's, that's a tough one to answer. You know what I mean? I no, I guess say. there's a billion different options there. Yes, that, that's the only thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a tough one. Again, I think with Deborah's example, like per personally not playing around with blood pressure. Right. Tr truthfully, again, it depends. You know, I think it's going to depend on what, what, how high what, is it? How yes, long has what, it been up? What's going on? Yeah. Right. But again, that definitely not something that we know it's not good to play around with it. So, so and we know there's drugs that work and are generally well tolerated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. But yeah, that, I guess that's why it's a tough one to answer. Yeah. I mean, certainly, yeah, the seriousness of the issue. I mean, that's, that's a really mm -hmm. obvious answer. Um, you know, if you're having trouble, you know, God forbid breathing, you have asthma, you have COPD, there are drugs you need to take, Yeah, you know, there blood pressure. There are some pretty innocent drugs. So I just think that again, it's like a cop out answer, but it's very individualized. Sure. And it's really about the severity of the condition as well as the severity of your stage in it. You know, are you young with very slightly mildly elevated blood pressure? Can we kind of intervene early on with some magnesium and Hawthorne? Potentially. Sure. Are you, are you, do you have multiple you know, morbidities and you're 75 and your, your blood pressure, you just like, you know, you're refusing to take the med or whatever. You, you refuse the new one that the doctor added on because right. you don't want to take a third one and your numbers are running high. Yeah. You've got to take the drug. So you know, I think we're always going to be balanced about that as much as possible um, when it comes to when to take meds and when the meds are good, okay, however sure, you sure, term sure. it. The problem is, and just keeping it 100 right here, yeah. is that, I mean, working in this business, I mean, between the pharmacy business, the supplement business, the talk show business, all this kind of stuff, is that there is there is a dichotomy of, of our listenership, right? It's the it's it's people hard fast in one camp, hard fast in the other these guys are crazy because they recommend supplements and vice versa. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? They're mm -hmm. crazy because all they want to do is put you on blood pressure medication. Right. When, when really I, I, I'm just kind of over that, that stark dichotomy, like medication versus no medication supplement versus, you know, yeah. just trying to, trying to make that distinction, I think has gotten quite exhausting. And in my mind, the, the pharmaceutical industry is humongous. The supplement industry is humongous. Yeah. So at the end of the day, if you think that one really has your has the best interest for you versus the other, if you're looking at it from like the level right. of the CEO, like I, just just go, just Google, just go home and Google the size of the supplement industry. Just go home and Google the size of the pharmaceutical industry. You'll see these are both very big industries. Right. And they and but that's fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's fine. They they there's a there's a benefit and there's a there's a continual process of advancement and testing and safety assurance and all these things that, that come along with those industries growing as well. So again, just kind of to back up, it's that the dichotomy is exhausting yeah. and there's a place for both truly. And, and again, they're both big industries and they're both, they have, they both have flaws, yeah. you know, they, they really do. And, um, I think that that's, the, that's the crux of this question too, is that some, most people here are going to have a, uh, a balance of both of those things. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to be so black and white about yeah. it. Yeah. And nowadays being in the middle doesn't really sell well, so to no. say. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there are times even I wonder, like, are we not being bold enough or making enough? But sometimes being in the middle with some of these things is what's bold. Well, because it, like, like Dante said, it's it's the di constant dichotomy of you're a kook because you're recommending supplements or you're a pawn of the drug industry because you said the drugs yeah, are Yeah, okay. because right. you're recommending a 299 statin. Yeah. Like you're working for big statin. Yeah. You know? I mean, yes. like, yeah. It, but I digress. Yeah, you're but right. The, you're but, right. But the point you're making is that we're always going to do our best to tell you the truth as best we see. Do our best. Yes. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And that's what we want. This got a lot more philosophical than I expected <laughs> it to. I, thought I like it, that, though. That's like the know. elephant in the room a lot of times with Dante brought up. It is. Sure. It, for sure. But, but again, it's, it's, and I, I know I said working in these businesses and, you know, personalized it a lot, but you, as far, if, if we're speaking to a pharmacist at home or a pharmacy technician or somebody that casually walks into a drugstore, there's going to be supplements on the shelf. Yep. There's going to be over the counters. There's medications. It's, it's, a, it's everywhere. It's just, it's just the part of um, the way the world is. And so the better that you can recognize a, a, so to speak, a good product, safe product versus 
this company that just popped up off the street and they have right. no labeling to show who tested their product or if their laboratory is, you know, good manufacturing um, mm -hmm. practices. Yes. Yeah, all, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's right. This is more or less just a, you know, commentary on the, you know, whether you're the consumer or the pharmacist or the technician that um, it's, it's going to be around you at all times. But I would say hmm. two other, two other products that for me that have sort of, that maybe you don't need, but that, but that have become kind of non-negotiable personally. Sure. Uh, would just be having protein powder on hand at all times and also creatine powder. Um, so again, we, you know, we talked about the, how important muscle strengthening, you know, muscle strengthening activities are, and, you know, I'm not going to harp on that much more since I already, I, I was on my soapbox for a minute. Um, we know that consuming adequate protein is essential for more than just bodybuilders. Um, I don't think supplemental, you know, I don't think supplemental protein is necessary on a daily basis, but there's invariably going to be instances where we were busy or we didn't grocery shop yet that you are going to fail, so to speak yeah. on your daily protein requirement, whatever that is. So protein powder is something that bridges the gap. You can leave it in your office drawer. You can leave it in your pantry. You can leave it sort of wherever it's quick and easy. It's a good, healthy, clean source of food and macronutrient, uh, you know, what we carry is not loaded with carbohydrates and fats. It's, it's a protein isolate, whether in the plant form or in the whey form, doesn't really matter. Both of them have enough in the way of, you know, um, the amino acid profiles are concerned, but again, having some protein on hand kind of can't go wrong. It takes me two, three months to go through a 30 serving protein yeah. container. And again, that's just because for the most part, I, I can kind of squeeze it in with with foods, but right. I'm okay with kind of considering a pr protein powder, another source of food, sure. especially if that means you skipping a serving or two of, of protein a day. Right. So that would be number one. Number two, again, is the creatine exercise. Again, essential for good health for some maximizing performance of that exercise is of priority. Yeah. And so the, the verdict is out on creatine. It's safe. It's effective. It's reasonably priced. It's well tolerated. It checks all the boxes that we mentioned with, you know, some of the other products. Mm -hmm. Basically, it just improves our capacity to exercise by the way of enhancing ATP or energy regeneration. So, if you want to try to maximize the amount of muscle strength over a lifetime that you can um, sort of sort of accumulate, or you want to maximize the amount of um, muscle mass. Creatine is just another example of something that you can take, you know, two and a half to five grams a day with minimal downside with, you know, all those boxes checked that, um, you know, have a benefit. There's, there's even the potential for cognitive benefits as well. Um, it's just, it's a bit more, yeah, it's a bit mm -hmm. more controversial, but again, we, you know, we have videos on creatine. I mean, you could go on YouTube and watch a thousand videos on creatine. Oh, yeah. There's, there's multiple consensus statements from major uh, organizations about the safety and utility of, uh, creatine for most level, for most athletes and for most, you know, sort of regular Joes and, yep. um, that's worth the proof, considering the proofs, in, the proofs in the pudding. And it's, it's worth at least considering that makes yeah. sense. And just to emphasize the protein, um, like Dante said, but just to emphasize it again, more than muscles, protein is going to help you curb hunger. It's going to help, um, kind of flat line or, or keep your blood sugar more steady. It's a, it's a good form of energy of glucose for the body again, slow release. And also precursor to your neurotransmitters, your brain neurotransmitters, calming neurotransmitters, et cetera. They're, they're based, their precursor is protein. So when you're, when you're missing that or you're low from your diet, it's again, a lot more than just muscles. Wow. Okay. Email in from Patricia. She said, I am a customer and I'm currently taking your joint essentials plus and super immune essentials along with Zocor, Losartan, Toporol XL, uh, Levothroid, and Celebrex. Would I be able to add the Inflamove I've heard you talking about, or would there be any bad interactions with these meds? You mentioned interactions earlier. Yeah. This is uh, an interesting one, though, because it is somebody kind of in the middle that's, that's doing both, that's yeah. doing supplements. You know, again, we don't see a ton of that, or, or if we do, they're a little quieter about it, but it is interesting that somebody just open and honest up front about that they're they're trying to to find this balance themselves so you know? okay so can she do the inflamove is there some reason she should or shouldn't i don't know what all those are all those other yeah, medications she can um you do want to be careful with inflamove because it does have herbs for inflammation okay so the celebrex is an anti-inflammatory 
the reason why it's it's okay in her case versus if she was doing more of an ibuprofen or an aproxen is because it's, I'm going to get too technical, but it's COX-2 selective. Okay. So it does not have the same platelet effects. So if she was taking XYZ and ibuprofen is anti-inflammatory, caution, she's taking XYZ plus Celebrex, um, there's less of a concern. It's not 100%, but practically speaking, there's a lot less of a concern because Celebrex is in the new generation of anti-inflammatory. So in a nutshell, I'm sure Dante has some other things to add. I would say it's okay for that for that reason. Okay. But that's, that's kind of the, the gray area that if she looked up Inflamove anti-inflammatory drugs or whatever she could she could maybe find some things that that didn't quite add up. Is is joint essentials plus and Inflamove are they the same thing? They're not the same thing because we have separate things. No. What do they do? Joint essentials plus is primarily glucosamine and chondroitin. The plus part basically means it's got the main two ingredients in high amounts. Joint essentials alone, and maybe these aren't named perfectly. We didn't know exactly what what to call them. Yeah, They're yeah. two different joint comprehensive joint products. Joint essentials without the plus is glucosamine and chondroitin, but it's got the herbs for inflammation. So there would be oh, okay. technically some doubling up if she added Inflamove, but maybe not because there's not a ton of the herbs in joint essentials. But in general, it's it's much easier that she's on the plus because there's none of these herbs in there got to it. keep it clear. And in fact, if she was on joint essentials, I'd probably recommend she swapped for that reason. Because you can use the Inflamove a little more acutely. You can take so it's got turmeric, kind of its main ingredient. You can take that ongoing. It's a great, great anti-inflammatory, great antioxidant. It's a great product. But you can kind of use the Inflamove if you'd like, maybe more after exercise or days when you when it hurts or nights when it hurts, etc. You can use it a little more as needed or acutely versus some other supplements. Okay, very very cool. Did you have something you wanted to add? I mean, I would say that pretty much covers it. There, there's still all NSAIDs, which. Celebrex is considered like it, they, no matter which one it is, they carry the same warning tech, mm -hmm. you know, from a technicality aspect. So I would definitely, I would still be careful. I mean, at the doses of those herbs and of the turmeric that's in the, um, Inflamove, I mean, it, it, they don't strike me that they're at such high doses that for, you know, for anybody that it's, that it's a massive concern, but again, you you know, we're looking at averages, uh, right. you know, in terms of populations of, of people who are more or less likely to have a given effect. Um, but it, it would be, I would be, you know, find it a bit surprising if, you know, if she had a history of, let's say like ulcer disease or GI bleeds and such that she would even be on an NSAID like this sort of routinely. Um, but those are, you know, again, for the listener who are, are in a close to a similar situation, which yeah. this is a very, again, this is a very kind of, common uh, recipe of medications we see every day. And um, if, if there are others that hear this, just know that no matter what the NSAID is, there's still, it still carries sort of the same risk. And it's important to know what specific risk fast factors you might have. And right. just know that you're, you know, make sure your doctor knows all those things. As so well. it should be okay, but do pay attention for sure. And if you're on high doses of any of those, that's the that's the thing to really pay attention to. Still be careful, to. but she at least is technically on a lower end of risk relative to the ibuprofens. But yes, still yeah. absolutely be careful. Yes. Yeah, and even and even, you know, the more I'm looking at it now, it's it's uh we can assume if she's asking about Inflamove, she's on the joint essentials, she may have some sort of osteoarthritis mm -hmm. or or whatever. Yeah. Um again, it, it's just it would be it, it would be nice to be able to ask more questions and you know, understand maybe more of some of the lifestyle things that she's doing, how she's sleeping, what, what does her exercise, what, what sorts of things, you know, is she doing or not doing? Right. Is her, um, current exercise routine a little bit more than she can handle at the moment? Did her doctor tell her something about her joints? Um, did she have an MRI an x-ray? Yeah. Was there something that prompted this that I think that in conversation, um, you know, we could always do a little bit better sure. answering. Absolutely. So that is uh, a good thing to say. If you're going to email us, which we would love for you to do, questions at askjoedomadio.com, uh, please give us as many details as possible. <laughs> uh, age, gender, lifestyle, all those things are very, very helpful. Um, we can make certain assumptions, but they are still assumptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more details we have, the more specific we can be in answering. You guys got anything else? We talked a lot today. Mm -hmm. All right. Good well, stuff. That's, we'll, we'll stop. All of our products <laughs> are available on our website, askjoedematteo.com. That's A-S-K-J-O-E-D-I-M-A-T-T-E-O.com. That site is also where you can sign up for our mailing list, which is the best way to stay informed about what's going on 
Uh, you can find past episodes of this show. You can find classic episodes of the show that started all of this. Uh, Ask Joe DiMatteo, all there on that website. If you have a question, email us, questions at AskJoeDiMatteo. Show notes, uh, everything we talked about, any any articles referenced will be available um, on uh, the, the, the website where you're listening to this or watching this on. If you are listening, you're missing half the fun, uh, seeing us make goofy faces at each other. Every episode is available as a video too. Just go to YouTube or Rumble and look for Generation Health. Big thanks to Josiah Schweinberg for the camera operation and keeping us laughing. Michael Depish, our editor. Joyce Gibb, our nurse practitioner. She handles private consultation. She's fantastic. Diane Silverman manages our products. Terry does scheduling. Cecilia does distribution. That's Joey DiMatteo. That's Dante DiMatteo. And that's it for us this week. <laughs> But now it is your turn. Are you going to take what you've heard and do something with it? Or are you just going to listen and be entertained? We hope that you will be part of this generation, Generation Health.